Our scripture reading this morning is in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. As I thought, I, I gave verse 42 as the beginning point. I just want to back up one verse. Nobody panic. I'll, uh, I'll read verse 41, and then we'll pick up here in verse 42. But what I want us to see here, of course, is another example of our Lord Jesus Christ and one of the few examples we have of what He was like when He was a child. And again, I would particularly draw the attention of those who may be around this age. We don't have too many any longer in the church that are around this age. But um, I, I do want us to see, again, what we would expect of our Lord Jesus Christ, that in all things, He honored the Lord at every point in His life. So let me begin reading in verse 41. I'll read through verse 52 of Luke chapter 2. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which, which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. We're going to focus primarily on, uh, well, really all of this, but um, primarily on verse 52, the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ continued to increase in wisdom and stature, but particularly in favor with God and men and how it is that He actually did that. Now, again, just by way of review, we have seen that eternal life is more than just being saved from hell. And it's more than just knowing about Jesus Christ, hearing the gospel, being saved, coming to the church and becoming a student, you know, and just learning all there is to learn and just being excited about learning new things about the Bible. And, you know, that is good. It's encouraging. We all enjoy doing it. But if our relationship with the Lord, if, if our knowing Him doesn't go beyond just learning, then once we've learned everything there is to learn, then our, the excitement's going to, to abate and we're probably just going to you know, lose that excitement and maybe go our own way. Knowing the Lord is more than that. It is actually, of course, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Now again, this knowing is a personal relationship, but I would remind you again this morning, it is a relationship that is meant to transform us into that image of Jesus Christ, to make us like Him by the power of His Holy Spirit. So realize that the Gospels were written... You know, not only to show us what Jesus Christ did, not only to teach us, of course, what He said, but it is also written that we may know what He was like, that we might have an example to follow. Well, we've been asking the question, what then is Jesus like? What is it that Jesus actually did? What is it that we are to follow? Well, first of all, we've seen that Jesus loved His Father. And he loved him with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his soul, and all of his strength. In other words, Jesus was completely devoted to the Father. He didn't love him just part-time. He loved him all the time. You know, he wasn't a part-time Christian. 
He was full-time. And that's what He wants us to do. We also saw, secondly, that Jesus loved His neighbors. He loved Himself. He treated them precisely as He Himself would want to be treated. But again, both of these things is just simply another way of saying that our Lord Jesus Christ kept the law. Again, I realize that the law of God has a lot of bad press today in, in various churches. They don't believe that we need to keep it. Somehow it's legalistic. It would be if you were keeping it to save yourself because we can't save ourselves. Jesus kept it to save us. But we do need to realize what the law of God really is. The law of God is actually a definition for us of what it means to love God and to love our neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. When we say that Jesus kept the law, what we mean is he loved his father and he loved his neighbor. And that's exactly what he wants us to do. That's why he saved us. And that's why he gave us the example that he did. And, and again, I would challenge you to look anywhere in scripture to see anything that Jesus did that was ever unloving. It was always exactly what needed to be done. It's what Everyone needed to hear, even when he rebuked the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Now, this morning, what I'd like for us to consider is that Jesus Christ not only loved his father and was fully devoted to him and loved his neighbor as himself, but that he did this all the time. He did this throughout his life from the very beginning to the very end. And he needed to do this. That's why he came into the world as a child. That's why he didn't drop down out of heaven as a full-grown adult and go straight to the cross because there was more to be done than simply dying on the cross. Sometimes we reduce Christianity and the life of Christ to that one act, but he had to live the whole life, uh, everything, he had to go through everything that we went through in order, again, to earn a perfect righteousness for us and to be an example for us. That's why he was conceived in the womb of the virgin. That's why he was born. That's why he went through childhood, early adulthood, and even you know, through a portion of his adulthood before he went to the cross. That's why he went through every phase of life. It was not just to save us, not just to sympathize what we're going through so that he could be our great high priest, but that he might be an example to us. Now, when we look at this passage that I've just read, uh, verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God, with, uh, with God and man, what usually stands out to us in this passage as being unusual is that our Lord Jesus Christ increased in wisdom. Now, it's not so strange that he increased in stature. I mean, he went from a babe to a full-grown adult, so he, he did grow up, but he increased in wisdom. How can that be? I mean, after all, Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in human flesh. As God, He is infinite. He is eternal. He is unchangeable. How could He increase in wisdom? How could He learn? Well, we do need to remember that Jesus was more than just God, although it's hard to imagine, you know, putting it that way sounds kind of strange. More than God? What could be more than God? Well, He was also man. That's the point. Fully human. Uh, as a human being, he was finite. As a human being, he was temporal, and he was changeable. He grew from a child to an adult. And in the same way, when he was taught, he learned. He learned from what he was taught. He learned from his experiences. He grew in wisdom. So we do need to understand that Jesus didn't come into this world as a deified human being with infinite knowledge at his disposal, otherwise he could not have increased in wisdom, but he actually learned as we would learn, and that's important for us to understand, because Jesus can relate to us, can't he? Because he went through what we went through. But there is something else here that we also overlook. He grew in favor with God. Grew in favor with God? And he grew in favor with man. Well, how could he do that? I mean, he was already infinitely loved by his father from the very beginning, wasn't he? And what about man? Did others really grow in their affection for him? Well, that's exactly what Luke tells us. But how could that happen? Well, I would suggest to you that it was through his growth in obedience 
and character. When you do what honors the Father, uh, you grow in His favor. That's what the Bible tells us. And oddly enough, although we don't often think of it in these terms, especially because of the way people responded to Jesus Christ, when you obey the commandments and love your neighbor as you love yourself, people like that. They, they do enjoy that, and you grow in their favor. I think that's one of the reasons why Jesus tells us, let your good work shine before men in such a way that they may glorify your Father. It does actually draw them in. It's only when you tell them that they're not doing what they're supposed to do that uh, things get a little bit rough. They don't like that as well. But they love for you to love them in the way that Jesus calls you to love them. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. He, he loved His Father and grew in favor with His Father as human being. And He loved His neighbors, He loved Himself, and so He also grew in favor with them. Now, that's important because that is exactly what Jesus wants us to do. That is the example that He left us, to love His Father and to love our neighbor throughout our lives as Jesus Christ did. So this morning, let's just consider briefly what Jesus was like in the various phases of life and consider through this how we might be more like Him. Now, what I'd like to do is just divide it into two main areas, what Jesus was like as a child and what Jesus was like as an adult. Now, sometimes we separate life into more phases than just two, but uh, in the Jewish mind, there were really only two phases. And actually, Jewish children grew up quite a bit faster than we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 13, I think, was the dividing line. But Paul gives us, you know, t reminds us that there's really only two phases to life. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he says this, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things, childhood and adulthood. So let's begin by considering what Jesus was like as a child. And of course, I can tell you right now <laughs> that He was perfect. But what does that mean? And let me just say at the outset, too, that even though perfection is the standard, and even though, as we're going to see this evening, actually, that we're never actually going to be able to, to meet the standard, that it's still what we need to be striving after. So as we look at what Jesus Christ did, we realize because of the sin in us, we're never going to reach what He reached. We're never going to be exactly like Him in this life, although we will be once we die and we are perfected and we enter into heaven. But that's still what we need to be striving after. Now, I, I thought this would just be interesting to consider, even though it's something we really can't do anything about. But what was Jesus like as an infant? Now, I realize it might be a little bit speculative here, but not, I think, overly so. Now, Jesus, when He was a baby, undoubtedly cried on occasions when He was hungry and when He needed to be burped or when He needed to be changed. You know, the, that, there's nothing sinful in that, of course. But when He did it, He did it, we might say, in a sinless way. Now, ordinary babies, when they cry, when they're hungry or they have other needs, we know there's other things mixed into their hearts, even in, in their infancy stage, uh, like anger. I'm, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, no, I'm uncomfortable. Take care of my needs. Take care of them right now. Uh, they're self-centered. Now, now, how do we know that, that that's the way they are? Well, we know that because that's the way we are when we grow up. You see, we just express it differently when we grow up, but we express it more fully. And we do see that people get angry, and we do see that they, they're self-centered, and, and really that's the essence of sin, isn't it? The essence of sin is, I'm going to live the way that I want to. I don't want to live the way that God wants me to. I'm going uh, to get what I can for myself. I don't care what happens to somebody else. Uh, selfishness, self-centeredness, and of course, getting angry when we don't get what we want, that is the essence of sin. But you see, Jesus didn't have any sin, did He? Even from His infancy, He had a heart that was fully disposed toward the Father, loved Him. And even though, and this sounds strange, I know, 
But I do believe it's true, even though Jesus didn't yet know who He was. Remember, as a man, He grew in wisdom, He grew in knowledge, He had a heart that was inclined toward the Father, but still didn't have that knowledge because His infant mind had not yet fully developed to that point. Even though He didn't know, He still was disposed toward His Father. He had a heart filled with the Spirit of God. And of course, as He grew, He was the perfect child. He obeyed his parents, he respected his elders, he treated his brothers and sisters with love and respect, he treated other children exactly the same way, he did his chores and he did those without complaining, he listened to his parents as they taught him the Word of God, even as Timothy was taught by his grandmother and his mother. Jesus enjoyed going to the synagogue. He enjoyed his time at the temple. Uh, we saw that already when he was at, you know, 12 years of age. His childhood was, as you might guess, impeccable, perfect, according to the law. So basically, that's what we know about Jesus' childhood. It was absolutely perfect. Now, we do know a bit more of what Jesus was like as an adult, and so we move on to that now. In Jesus' day, uh, you know, I, I said we, we divide our different phases of life into more phases than the Jews do, but we need to realize that in, the, in Jesus' day, uh, there were not these subcultures that we have in our culture today. There was no teenage subculture, for instance. When Jesus reached age 13, He had His bar mitzvah. Now, how do we know that? We don't see it in the Scripture. We know that because that was a part of Jewish tradition, part of Jewish culture. This was the rite of passage. When Jesus moved from being a boy and he passed from childhood into adulthood, bar mitzvah means he became a child of the law. He became responsible to keep it before God. He was no longer considered a child, but now he was considered an adult. Boy, we call that pretty much pre preteen and early teen. Uh, we don't see that in our culture, but in the Jewish culture, that responsibility was laid on them, and that's when they began to take it up. And we know that in our culture, even though our children that age aren't terribly mature, they need to be, and they have this capability, and that's what the Lord would have them to do. Now, we do know at this point, Jesus kept the law of God perfectly, even as He had throughout His childhood. As a young man, He continued to honor God. And to continue to honor his parents, he didn't fall into any of the pitfalls that we, we see today. He didn't become addicted to pleasure. He didn't go off and party with his friends. He didn't do things behind his parents' back. He didn't become intoxicated. He didn't commit immorality. He didn't join in cliques. He didn't, you know, say we're, in, we're the in people and, and belittle everybody that wasn't a part of that group. Jesus didn't fight he didn't lust, he didn't steal, he didn't lie, he didn't become discontented if somebody had something that he wanted or if he, somebody else was more popular than he was. Jesus continued to love God with all his heart and all his soul and his neighbor as himself. In his early years, remember Jesus began his ministry at 30, he had an occupation, he had a vocation. Jesus was a carpenter. And he learned that trade from his earthly father, and he did it faithfully. How do we know that? Well, because he was a carpenter and because he was perfect. Uh, he dealt fairly with the people who, who came to him. He did the best work he possibly could do. And I believe he even used his, his earnings, his wages, to care for his family. You know, it appears that Joseph might have been dead by the time that Jesus began his ministry. So it's possible that Jesus actually had to provide for his family for a while. And during this time, again, Jesus continued to love his neighbor as he loved himself and to worship and love his father perfectly. Now, we actually have much more about Jesus in his ministry years. We know here that he loved his father with an undivided heart. He devoted himself to his cause. He did all that the father had called him to do. He went everywhere preaching the gospel, teaching about the kingdom of heaven, 
performing miracles, uh, reproving and exhorting. When he did so, he continued to love his neighbor as himself by using these things to minister to them, by teaching them, by healing them, and ultimately by laying down his life for them. When Jesus was attacked, he never retaliated, but he always returned good for evil. He never sought his own pleasure, but rather sought his pleasure in giving his Father pleasure and, of course, in serving his fellow man. In every way, Jesus was a perfect example to us of what it is God wants us to be. Now, again, think about everything I've just said. Do you disagree with with anything that Jesus did that God doesn't want us to do? He wants us to live that way. Now, if Jesus had lived into his later years, nothing would have changed. He would have continued to do the same thing to his very dying breath, loving and serving God with an undivided heart and loving and serving his neighbor as he loved himself. Now, again, the point in all of this is that this is what the Lord wants you and me to be like. This is the example that He has given us to follow. Jesus, again, when He he went through all of this, yes, He did it to earn a perfect righteousness. Yes, He did it to be a sympathetic high priest. But He also did it to be an example to us of how He wants us actually to live. And remember, this is what it means to know Jesus Christ, to know His life in us, to know His power in us, is to live as he lived. And so ask yourself this morning, is this the image that you're growing into? Is this, is this the, you know, the way that you're living? Is this the example that you're following? And is this, you know, again, that image you're growing into? Now, again, there's not much you can do when you're a baby to follow this example. We're, we're going to be what we are, you know, what we are because we just don't understand. And unless our hearts are changed at that particular age by the Spirit of God, we're going to be like everyone else, and we're going to have that disposition to be self-centered and, and to get angry. Now, we can't do anything about it, but that's why our parents need to. And those of you who are parenting small children who are still in that stage, you need to realize that you need to pray and seek for the salvation of your children by praying that God would grant to them mercy because they can't do it for themselves. They are absolutely helpless, and I think we understand that. And by the way, if your children are grown up and out of the house, or if they're grown up and in the house, and they still don't know the Lord, you need to continue to seek for them as parents and pray that God would change their hearts and bring them to Himself, that they would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you you really never stop praying, but particularly pray until you see Christ being formed in them, because that's how you know that they really are saved, is when you see Jesus Christ in them. That's the goal of salvation. Now, if you're a child here this morning, if you are to know Jesus Christ, you need to follow this example as well that He gave you. And again, all of us are children, I suppose, uh, at some degree in life. Uh, we all had parents and so forth. And, but particularly younger children, actually, I'm not sure that I see any of our younger children here this morning. So parents... You can teach this to your children when you see them. (laughs) You need to obey your parents. By the way, those of you who will be parents, remember this is what you need to be training your children to do. Obey your parents. Respect your elders. Treat your brothers and your sisters with love and respect. Uh, Treat your other other children, other friends with love and and respect. Uh, Do your chores. Listen to what your parents teach you. By the way, that's one of the reasons why Jesus knew as much as He did, wasn't it? It wasn't because, again, divine knowledge was permeating His his human mind, but it was because He listened to His parents. It's because when He went to synagogue, He listened to what was being taught because He had a heart that desired that, and He was soaking it in like a sponge, so much so that the teachers in in the temple were amazed at His understanding. Again, I think oftentimes... And I know myself, as I was, you know, growing in my understanding of of who Jesus is, we just think, well, of course He did. 
He's God in human flesh. He knows all things. He's challenging them. He knows more than they did. But really, he grew in wisdom like the rest of us. He just did it much more effectively because he was perfect in his heart towards the Lord. He really loved the, that truth and really wanted to understand it. And again, I do believe there were times in Jesus' life, of course, when the Father communicated divine knowledge to him by, by the Holy Spirit, certainly as he begins his ministry. It's not that there was never a connection, but Jesus was also ignorant of when he was coming again, right? That day and that hour, nobody knows, not, not, not the angels. The Son of Man doesn't know that, but the Father only. Well, how could that be true unless Jesus had limited knowledge? It's because he was fully man. We need to, to take that into account. But so he, he learned. He went to the synagogue and, and he listened. Uh, you need to go to church and listen and have a heart that is disposed toward learning the things of the Lord and pray that the Lord would give you such a heart to listen to him and to follow him. That's what it means to know Jesus. Those of you who are adults, young adults, past 13 perhaps, you haven't gotten into your vocation yet, you realize that even though society may look at you as children, the Lord looks at you as young men and women as adults responsible for your own actions, responsible to follow the Lord. And the Lord's going to, of course, hold you accountable for that. So are you being responsible? Are you loving God as He calls you to? with all your heart and with all your soul? And of course, are you honoring your parents and following what it is they taught you as they taught you the Word of God? Are you doing that? Are you treating others the way you want to be treated, the way Jesus tells you to love others? And are you avoiding the snares that the enemy has placed all around you, that the world has placed all around you? Ungodly company, immorality, partying, drunkenness, are you resisting the temptation to look down at other people and to desire to be the most popular among them? Or are you humbling yourself the way that Jesus humbled himself and becoming the least among them, becoming the servant of all? You see, that's what it means to know Jesus Christ is to be like him and not like the world. And what about those of you, of course, who are older and you're in your jobs, you're in your vocations now? Are you doing the best that you can for your employer? Are you dealing honestly and fairly? Are you doing the work that you do for God's glory and for the good of your neighbor? You know, it was once said that, um, you know, that perhaps um, uh, two people making, you know, let's say the same product uh, back in the days, you know, well, even today would still be the case. The person who makes it for the glory of God and for the good of his neighbor does the very best that he can, makes the best product he can, sells it at the fairest price that he can so that he can be a blessing to other people and people buy them and the person prospers because he's doing what the Lord would call him to do. Now, we all aren't making products. We're not all selling various things, but all of us have some kind of work and we need to do the work that we do for the glory of God. So are you doing what you do for the good of your neighbor? Are you laying your life down for others like Jesus did? Are you caring for your families? If you have your own family, are you caring for their needs? What about the family you were raised in? Are, do you still care about them? You know, Jesus, um, before he began his three and a half year ministry, it looks like he was taking care of his family because his dad had passed away. Sometimes when we grow up, we kind of leave our family behind and we don't think too much about them. And we're not as concerned about them as we should be, but we need to be because that's what Jesus did and it's right and it's loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. So are you continuing to love God with an undivided heart and soul? Are you loving your neighbor as you love yourself? You see, that's what it means to know Jesus. And then what about your final years when you retire? And the best of your years are behind you and your strength is all but gone. Now, Jesus didn't live to old age. He didn't go through his senior years. But Jesus did honor his father to the very day of his death, didn't he? After he had been beaten, after he had been crucified, when he was on the cross, when his strength was all but gone and his life was, was coming to an end, he was still the perfect example of what it is he wants us to be. He still loved his father. 
He was on the cross for His glory, and He still loved His neighbor, didn't He? He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prayed for His neighbor that the Father might forgive them for their sins. Those of you who are older, have you set your heart to love Him with an undivided heart and to love and pray for your neighbor until the very last moment of your life? I think the life of Jesus shows us that being a Christian is not a part-time occupation, is it? It's not something you switch on and off. It's not something you simply do when you want to do and you set it aside when it's not convenient. Because when you turn it off, you step off the path. When you step off the path, you sin. When you sin, you grieve the Spirit. And when you grieve the Spirit, you set yourself back and you become less like Jesus. Jesus shows us that being a Christian means you need to be a full-time Christian. You need to purpose in your heart to love Him and to honor Him and to love your neighbor as yourself in everything that you do at all times from right now to the very end of your life. You see, that's what it means to know Jesus. And so let me ask you this morning, do you know Jesus in that way? If you don't, then you need to turn from your sins and trust in Him because that's the only way that you're going to gain the Spirit of God to be able to do what the Lord calls you to do. But if you do, and like the rest of us, you fall short, if you do know Him, if you've already trusted, you've already turned from your sins, realize there is still a work, there is still a battle, and this doesn't happen automatically. There's, a, there's warfare that's going on. You need to fight against, the, against your, your flesh and put it to death. And you need to seek God for His Spirit and yield to the Spirit of God. Uh, submit to Him as He seeks to lead you in the Word of God. As He's this morning through His Word basically painted a picture of, of who Jesus Christ is, the Spirit of God is going to be leading you to submit to that, to, to become like that. You need to submit to Him. You need to yield to Him. You need to obey Him and go the direction He would have you to go so that you might become more like Him. Well, that's what the Lord calls us to do. If you would know Jesus Christ, that is the path that you need to walk on, that we all need to walk on. So let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would um, help us uh, to do that, that He would take His Word and apply it uh, to us.